welcome everyone to the Town of Richmond Planning Commission meeting for November 1st, 2023. First day of November, first day of winter. Mm -hmm. All good. Um, it looks like we have a couple of guests. Oh, we got David back instead of his ceiling. That that was a good tour of your space there, David. <laughs> um, so we'll start with our agenda. The first item is to review and make any adjustments that we wish to the agenda. So the agenda, apart from the basics, consists of number five and number six. I doubt that we will get to number eight. So number five is a discussion of a couple of items. One is the two principal residential structures on a lot concept and the multifamily unit development standards. Both of these were introduced in our RC districts and we knew we would likely have to work out some kinks with them. So we're gonna talk about them a little bit today. We'll introduce them and talk about them um, with plans for a longer discussion down the line a little bit. But we thought we'd introduce the reasons that we've put this in here and where we're going with it and some possibilities for commissioners to think about how we might want to solve the issues that uh, have come up. So that's the first one. The second one is a continued review of our two village neighborhood districts. And these new districts are going to be including the Act 47 standards. And we will also be talking about the two residential uses on a lot as it relates to those districts. So those are the two things that we're gonna be talking about. In the packet, I would like to add are the documents that we approved at our last meeting for our public hearing on December 6th, the amendments relative to um, adding some residential uses by way of the PUD into the industrial commercial district. Um, and we're not gonna talk about those today. I just put them in there because at our last meeting, we approved them based upon some small amendments or maybe not so small amendments that we made at the meeting at which we approved them. And I wanted the commissioners all to get a chance to look at the documents that are out there now as the final documents. Mm -hmm. We understand there will be some additional tweaks that we have to make in these documents. We're gonna talk about that at our public hearing on the 6th. That's the next time we're gonna look at these documents. We're going to find out our town attorney's comments on these documents at the December 6th hearing. We'll talk about it then. We'll take some outreach um, and we'll look at some other associated tweaks that we're going to have to make to make those documents fly. So the schedule is going to be December 6th for those documents, and then we'll probably talk about all that information that we get at the public hearing at our following meeting. Anyway, so that's why those are in there, even though they are not appearing on the agenda. So uh, any changes anybody want to make to the agenda? All right, so hearing none, we'll proceed with the agenda as written. And now we'll take any public comment on items not on the agenda. And it looks like we have Gary and David Sunshine here. If either of you have a non-agenda comment, this would be time to make it. Otherwise, I'm assuming that you're here for items on the agenda. All right. Okay. All right, so we'll move on to number four, which is to review the minutes from our last meeting, our meeting of October 18th. Were there any corrections or additions or changes that anybody wanted to make to those minutes? Okay, hearing none, we will consider those minutes to be accepted into the record as written. 
Okay, and we'll move on to the main part of our agenda, item number five. So this is fairly complicated. I'm thinking we can spend about half an hour with it today, which will not be the whole of the discussion, but it will start it off. There are two reasons that we want to talk about these two things. And the two items are our newly proposed or adopted by the select board plan to allow there to be two residential uses as principal structures on a single lot. The point of this was to give a third option to help with our housing crisis, to enable people to develop housing, a third option that was neither an ADU nor a duplex, which are both currently allowed to be on a single a separate lot with a single family home. You can put an ADU, you can put a duplex, those are permitted uses. They come with certain restrictions. The ADU has the family structure, it has a size restriction. So there are certain restrictions to the ADU. The duplex, as we have it currently, has to be attached to the house. So that's a restriction. It has to share a common wall or be connected. So this was to give people a third option, which is like putting an ADU with no size restrictions and no family ownership kind of restrictions. Um, and or to have a duplex, but that was not connected with a common wall. So that was the point of adding this in to our two RC districts, which is where it currently is the only place that it applies. We are going to want to consider whether or not to put it into these new village residential districts that we're working on right now. And the point there would be to give another way for people to have additional housing. We'll consider its ramifications. The way that it's involved with the multi-unit or multi-family housing development standards is that those standards, as currently written, um, are relevant to any lot that has three or more residential units on it. So we currently had the first occurrence of this come to our zoning department where a duplex added a third residence, making it three residential uses on a single lot. So the multifamily standards kicked in. There are a couple of things that we can do with these two different requirements. One is to disconnect them. Another is to change the multifamily standards to make them more palatable to our zoning people, our zoning officer and our DRB, both of whom have expressed some concern with those standards. So that's what we wanna talk about. We wanna talk about both of these as freestanding requirements, but also the way that they're connected together. And we will have to resolve what we're going to do with them before we can finalize the village neighborhoods. So any questions so far? <laughs> All right. So with the two principal structures on a lot, There has been um, resistance to this idea by the people in the two neighborhoods that we're considering, the village residential south, the village residential north. People in both of those districts have um, expressed some concern about this concept. So the options in thinking about that concern is we could just not have this slightly out of box thinking in those districts. That would be one possibility. 
currently it's a permitted use so you can have the two residential structures on a single lot on any lot which makes it a permitted use which makes it um, administrated by the zoning administrator we could make it a conditional use which would mean that it would go to the drb to be looked at so theoretically it would re you know it would uh, get more scrutiny if it went to the drb we could put it back into the pud process which is kind of where we took it out from to make it a little easier to use we took it out of the pud process in the pud process which we are amending somewhat in our other packet of amendments that we just approved for a public hearing. Um, you can do this. You can put two structures on a single lot that, uh, especially with some tweaks to the PUD standards, you're allowed to do that. So some people have suggested, okay, there are advantages of keeping it as a permitted use it makes it easier to use theoretically it helps us to enable more housing because it's easier to do now people are going to be more willing to do it so that requires the minimum amount of scrutiny just by the zoning administrative officer we could put it into the conditional use list which requires what i consider a moderate amount of scrutiny so it does go to the drb but it doesn't require the maximum amount of scrutiny, which is what it would require if it were put back into the pot with the other PUD. So what we need to consider as a commission is what do we want to do with this in these districts, in these two residential districts? And if we wanna make some bigger change about it, we'll have to go back and amend the RC districts as well, because that's the only other place that it occurs. So looking for any thoughts about this. Our original goal was to make it easier to make more housing. So if we back away from that goal and give it more review, then that's one way to go. Or we could just not have it in these districts at all and leave it in the RC districts as um, as we have it so far. So on behalf of the DRB. Yes. Um, is this a good time to start talking? Sure. Yep. Oh, Go right okay. ahead, David. OK. So as far as the DRB goes, what I, I, I certainly understand, and we understand, and here I'm speaking for myself, not for the DRB, because the DRB has not discussed this. Uh, I've I did send out notice that this meeting was going to take place, but from being on the DRB for a while, um, what caught my eye with the regulations, the proposed regs, were that there was some areas in there where it called for, um, for lack of a better word, aesthetical decisions by the DRB without much guidance in the regulations as to what those aesthetic, aesthetic decisions would be. And I think this is dangerous. Um, I've always wanted our regulations to avoid us having to make this, us being the DRB, having to make decisions um, based on aesthetics or you know, what the outside what the outside uh, structure will look like or something else because everyone has different thoughts and everyone has different ideas of what they would like a building to look at look like and I think the landowner is the person that owns it is paying the money for it and they should make the decision um, and there were I don't have the regulations unfortunately right in front of me but there were some areas where I think you were talking about the DRB addressing privacy concerns. 
And that really opens up a can of worms that I'm not sure the DRB should be involved in. Um, and it's going to it's going to bring some of that up because you're going to take. I, I remember very clearly when some of the houses on Main Street started to be broken up from large houses into duplexes and apartment buildings, and um, Obviously, some neighbors didn't want it, and you're going to get that. But, you know, if you're going to write these regulations and allow more housing, then part and parcel of having more housing is there isn't going to be as much privacy for everybody as there used to be because there's going to be more people with more windows, blah, blah, blah. So I would just urge the Planning Commission to be careful in writing the regs as far as that goes. And just to clarify, so under the current structure, the DRB isn't reviewing these two principal residential structures on a lot because it's a permitted use. The zoning administrator would be um, looking at it. If it became a conditional use or a PUD, then the DRB would have a role. and where David, I think, is coming from, from previous remarks, is in a case where the two principal residential structures now make three residential uses on a lot, what is called into play is the multi-unit development standards, one of which there was particular objection to, which is the privacy part, which instructs the DRB, if the DRB is reviewing it, or the zoning administrator, if he or she is reviewing it, to consider the placement of the windows so people aren't looking at each other's windows. That was the aim. And the reason that the whole set of multifamily development standards was adopted was to make people in the more densely populated areas of the town feel more comfortable with having multifamily buildings right next door to them. So to help to ensure that there was some kind of privacy. This can certainly be adjusted if that's too subjective to say that the DRB or the zoning administrator needs to consider the windows placement. We can certainly work on that. And in fact, Keith and Tyler are carefully going through that list of multifamily standards and talking with each other about how they could be altered or whether they're too stringent or whether they make any sense or one of the things that uh, could be done with it also is to restrict uh, the application of those standards only to multi-unit buildings. Right now, they apply to a lot that now has three or more residential units on it. So the recent case where there was a duplex and a single family home, there were three residences on a lot. It kicked it over into having those standards apply. The original point of the standards was to have them apply to multi-unit buildings. So that would be one thing that we could do is we could say they don't apply to any lot with three or more residences but to any multi-unit building. That doesn't necessarily mean that we don't want to adjust the standards themselves if they're too subjective to use or you know, if they're too difficult to use, whatever. Um, the other thing that we could do is we could make them apply if there are more, you know, five units or seven units or something that actually is a larger number where there's going to be more concerns. You know, we want to make sure multi-unit buildings, which are pretty new to Richmond, other than duplexes, you know, so we have some triplexes and so forth, but 
to make sure that they make good neighbors, that they don't bring down property values. You know, we heard that they were going to bring down property values and um, weren't going to be good neighbors. And so we put these standards in to help people feel more comfortable with having multi-unit buildings as neighbors. Because of Act 47, where we're going to have five units per acre as minimum density in the village, um, you know, we wanted to help people feel more comfortable with it. So, but we can talk about the standards themselves, whether they're too difficult or too amorphous to use. Um, we can talk about whether we want them just to apply to buildings and not lots that have that many units. Uh, we can talk about the number of units. We could adjust that. So all of those things are possible tweaks that we can make, especially thinking about the RC districts where these standards exist. And then we can think about whether we want to apply them at all. You know, the, the multifamily unit standards will apply in the village, but the two principal residential uses on a lot does not have to apply. That's not part of Act 47. And, um, you know, it's possible that we may want to either not have it apply or have it be a conditional use or put it back in the bucket with the PUD. Any commissioners have any thoughts or others? Yes, I'd like to say something again. An example, Virginia. David and oh, then Gary. Yep. Okay. Does Gary want to go first? I've already spoken. No, go ahead, David. Okay. Um, you know, on the outset, where the windows are located makes sense for a privacy standpoint. So one neighbor can't look in the window of another neighbor. That makes sense. The mm -hmm. problem is it doesn't always work. And, and sometimes we're confined to certain standards and some situation comes before us where it just doesn't work. And I can't give you a good example of that because it hasn't happened yet. But once it happens, I, you know, I've just seen it over and over again where some standard which makes sense in most situations doesn't always work. So what I would urge is that there be some ability where some rules aren't quite ironclad that there is flexibility, maybe uh, on the part of the DRB, where so we can in reason things this, out. In this particular case, the uh, 6.13.7, the privacy issue says, it shall be considered, which seemed to us like there was flexibility there that you aren't required to do anything one way or another, but you're required to consider it. So if you had a plan where somebody's window was looking directly into somebody else's window without a fence or screening or hedge or anything in between, you might say, this doesn't seem like a very good idea. Could you change the location of the window? But you only are required to consider it. If you see and, what I mean. And what Oh, I do. I do. And it makes sense. But when someone appeals our decisions, they're going to say, did the DRB consider it? Did they adequately consider it? I mean, it it just, I, I just would like to see some way where we could work and apply these standards without leaving gray area that can be exploited. Yeah. I mean, yeah, well, I know what you mean, and I see this elsewhere in the regulations. You know, I was looking through the subdivision regulations, and it says, for instance, if there is an inadequate amount of trees and shrubs on the property, the DRB may require that there be more trees and shrubs. Now, you know, who's going to say whether there's enough trees and shrubs? To me, that seemed very subjective. So I know that you have to deal with this in other areas and, of and for example the way we've dealt with that particular statement is we look at it and we'll try to make a decision but if neighbors come in and say we want more screening we'll listen to that because 
they're raising, you know, someone else is raising an objection to what the way the application is and can open the door for us to look at that and make sense. Otherwise, if no one comes in, you know, it, it's hard not to accept what the applicant gives us if it does the job as allowed in the ordinance and they spend the amount of money that they have to for landscaping. Yeah. yeah. And do you see this as being different than the windows question that you would only act on if a neighbor came in and complained that the windows were looking directly into their windows or do, do you see this as somehow different from that? No, I guess it's the same thing, uh, but I know that with a standard like that, that will come up. And I know that the our staff will address it right away. At least mm -hmm. Tyler would. Yeah. Um, okay. And, yeah, and well, that's okay. That's okay as long as there's standards for how we determine whether that window placement is correct or not. Right. Well, to me, it was like the trees thing. How do you determine what an adequate number of trees is or shrubs? I don't know. But anyway, so we're looking at it and Keith and Tyler are looking at it and they're going to make a recommendation about how they could more easily be administered, administrated. And um, so that will be as part of our next discussion about this topic. Gary. Uh, so a couple of things I want to say, though. I would suggest dropping the language uh, and going that it would go through the PRD process because I've probably gone, I, I might hold the record of the number of times I've been before the DRB. And I think under David's long leadership, the DRB in Richmond is not an onerous process. I mean, it's, it's usually friendly, but it does do a good review and it does offer the neighbors a chance to come in and raise like David said on landscaping, which you know I, I've had that exact example where, you know, they raise an issue that they didn't raise to me privately, and you know we work out terms, and I just think it's a, a much better process than to make it one where it just goes to Tyler to, you know, see if it checks off all the boxes. So I would encourage getting rid of it. I, I don't really see an advantage, advantage of keeping it. Uh, Are you talking about the two principal residential structures yeah. on a lot? Yeah. Not the multifamily development right. standards. Right. Okay. Um, I also would like to see the, the multifamily standards apply to build multifamily buildings, not to, not to mm -hmm. lots. And mm -hmm. when I did read the the multi-family standards, the thing that jumped out at me right off was the window thing because if if you have, I mean, how, how do you interpret that? How far away are you looking into a neighbor's lot that becomes objectionable? Is it uh, twenty feet or is it a hundred feet? Um, it, it and also. I'd say most houses in the village, probably one of their windows can look into a neighbor's window at some distance. I can't imagine a house that doesn't do that in the village. So it just seems like an impossible standard the way it is. Okay, would you have any stand, put in any standards relative to that concept? Of privacy, um, I I wouldn't for single family homes. I can see if suddenly you're facing. Well, this a, is for multifamily. This only applies to multifamily, especially if we make it just the buildings and not the lots. Right. But yeah. So the way you have it now, though, if somebody does a multifamily project that's single family homes on a lot, mm -hmm. um, they would be faced with this. Right. right. Yep. So if we make it, if we go back to making it just the buildings, then it's just the buildings. And the question is, you know, like if you have a three family dwelling building, it might not be an issue 
if you have a 10 family <laughs> dwelling, right. you know, it might be an issue. So um, right. I don't know if we want to think about those peripheral, you know, the fringe circumstances or the hypotheticals that we have that might need something maybe it's size related maybe if it's over a certain size the building then i don't know but so anyway if you have any thoughts about that having built buildings that are fairly close to each other any thoughts about how you think about i mean how do you think about the privacy when you're building two houses relatively close together do you think about it or not really i think about it all the time yeah i think about turning gable direction so you don't have any second floor bedrooms facing a, another window. You can do it by, you know, having a garage in between uh, so that you have can have a blank wall or just a window into a garage from, from, from it. But you can also, you know, if you're doing like a two story next to a story and a half, you can turn it like I said, the gable so that and not have any dormers on that side or something. There's there's ways of doing it. And yeah, so it seems like if you know, our thought was if there's a developer who's not thoughtful like you about this, those are exactly the kinds of things that we would like the DRB to consider a little bit. You know, if the developer is not going to consider them, do we care that they are or they aren't going to consider them? I mean, it seems like you think they're worth considering those things. Yeah, I I just think, like David said, it's got to be something, if you're going to keep them in, something that the DRB can consider, but don't don't make it like they have to do it. You know, if they don't, if they look at it and think, well, yeah, those two windows face each other, but for whatever reason, it's not a big deal. Then, then it shouldn't be. They shouldn't have to mm -hmm. force a standard that may not make sense. Right. Okay. Well, I mean, it seems like May considering it doesn't satisfy. <laughs> so I don't know exactly. I mean, we'll have to think about how we can do that you know how we can have it be optional and not too useless so i don't know david if you have anything else to add to that <clears throat> you're muted if you're speaking All right, well, while he's finding his mute button, um, any commissioners have anything they want to add to this discussion? Adam. Okay, we'll go to Adam and then uh, Aaron. Yeah, I guess I'm a little, uh, I, um, I'm trying to wrap my head around why we have this standard in place at all if we have a setback standard. And it seems like putting the onus on a property owner to avoid an adjacent property owner from having to provide screening where they deem necessary seems a little odd to me, um, especially if it applies to single family dwellings. So if a, you know, a house is built 10 feet from the property line and an owner of an existing house doesn't want to put anything in that lawn, they can force a neighboring property to redesign their house or to, you know, use up lawn space or uh, space with taller trees and little lower canopy to screen that property for them. It seems a little, I, I guess I'm trying to wrap my head around why we would have the setbacks in place um, if we're going to also require additional screening and house redesign to avoid these overlapping sight lines. And um, it seems like the setbacks would, if we don't think the setbacks are accomplishing their job by providing a level of privacy that's adequate for the district and what could be reasonably expected, then we should reevaluate that or uh, make it clear that if you would expect level of privacy that's not provided by those setbacks, that it would be incumbent upon you as a property owner to screen your own property. But I don't see it as reasonable to expect an, a neighboring property to accommodate 
wherever the windows happen to be in your house because you happen to want to, you know, have a house 20 feet from a neighbor and shower with the window open. I, I just don't, I understand why we put it into uh, alleviate concerns of people in the districts, but it seems like a very, uh, it, se it seems like people are kind of built their house how they want it or have their house how they want it and are more concerned about keeping it exactly as it is at the expense of future homeowners than it would be about actually having the privacy um, at any expense to themselves. So that's my concern. I, mean, so I guess what I'm getting at is I, I would say we pull it out, but I, I know that's gonna be an unpopular opinion. Um, so you mentioned single family homes. Do you see any difference between a three to four unit building, let's say, or a 10 to 15 unit building? Because if we, especially yeah. if we change it to only relate to multi-unit buildings rather than a multi-unit lot on which several single family homes could be put. If it's a multi-unit building, which was the original uh, motivation for it, then the question is, is there a difference? You know, do I we, mean, are we in interested mind, in some kind of privacy if there's a now yeah. going to be a 10 unit building next to your house? I don't know. That's an open question. I mean, for me. I, I, I understand the I understand people's concern and I feel for it. But realistically, if you own a house in town where the lot size is going to be one fifth of an acre, I don't think it's reasonable to assume that a three story building is going to have complete privacy from a neighboring three story building. I mean, it's going to require uh, it's either going to require decades of vegetation growth or it's going to be require having a house with absolutely no windows on one of the houses will have to have no windows on that side to have what some people would consider reasonable privacy. And that doesn't seem reasonable to impose on a neighboring property. And it seems very arbitrary because it'll be completely dependent on what neighbor is comfortable with what and what their expectations and comfort level are with the zoning in that neighborhood when they bought their house versus where it's headed now. And mm -hmm. so I understand the concerns, but I, I don't think it's reasonable to put that on a neighboring property. Um, if someone's doing it as a PUD or asking for something that is outside the zoning regulations to either shrink a setback or to increase a height or something of, along those lines. And I think it would be completely reasonable to take all the neighbor's concerns into consideration. But if someone's just building a house that meets the height requirements, meets the dimensional standards and is within the setbacks. And I, I guess I know I don't, I don't see how it, I don't see how a neighbor can arbitrarily force them to get rid of windows on the south side of their house because it happens to look at their house. Like, so they're not getting any sun now in their bedroom, mm -hmm. bathroom, wherever. Uh, that doesn't seem reasonable to me at all. No. Mm -hmm. um, so just before we go to Aaron, are there, were there any other issues in the list in 613 that concerned you? No, I Besides think the there... privacy issue, that was the one that seemed to draw the most comments. I mean, I think I think all, a lot of those, as David pointed out, those are kind of um, subjective standards are pretty tricky. But the privacy one seems to have the uh, the most subjective definition that I think has uh, is also, you know, um, has the most potential to be extremely arbitrary and based on uh, personalities and properties. So that was one that really stuck out to me. But um, and then as far as the multifamily standards, I mean, I. I understand all the concerns. I personally kind of view it more from like multi, uh, you know, a divided duplex where there's um, one owner. But I know, I know, um, Kathleen had raised concerns about you know what that would look like if it was condoized and two properties on one lot were sold independently. Mm -hmm. I see, I see both sides of it. I don't see it, you know, um, I don't see it as necessarily being bad to move it to maybe a DRB review. Um, I think that that, you know, especially I don't know if we can di differentiate if there were to be two pr properties on a lot owned separately and it was to be condoized. I think that deserves a much higher level of scrutiny than two principal structures and a lot that'll be owned by one owner, I guess we mm -hmm. do. I don't know if we can divide right. at that point. Right, yeah, that may be possible. All right, Aaron, did you have a comment? And then Joy and then David. Hi, yes, I did have a comment, um, just as me. Um, yes. I just want to say that, um, I live in the um, condos over by Stone Corral, and um, I have this is like this walkway just right in front of my house, and I've got windows, and people are out there all the time, and it's no big deal at all. 
And I mean, I moved here and I knew that there were windows there and I've got curtains and I've got blinds and having the windows is great. And, you know, I, it's kind of a, a, a non-issue. Um, I have as much privacy as I want, but I much prefer having windows and lots of free sunlight when it's available. And um, yeah, I, I think that <clears throat> when a structure is built, I think people do take a lot of natural caution to be to have privacy, but eventually, I mean, it's people can manage their privacy easily without waiting for long growth to happen to shield your windows. Um, and also, I'm just thinking about when I before I moved here, um, I lived in Virginia, and they have these like massive McMansion-y houses that they built like five five to six, mm -hmm. eight feet apart. And we used to laugh that they could, you know, open their windows and hand the gray Poupon mustard to each other. I mean, <laughs> it's just like preposterous, but those houses sold like hotcakes. And I mean, I just feel like, um, I, I don't think it's it's that much of, of an issue. It's super easy to control your privacy and windows are really important. So that's just my two cents. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Aaron. Um, Joy. You're passing or you're ready? No, no. Okay, no, yes. I'm here. Um, yes. So I, I would agree on the window issue. And if you're in the village or in these areas, you already, you knew when you got there that you're not living in the country. You're living in the this community where you're right next to, you know, all these other houses. I mean, I lived on Baker Street for a while and that's, that's what you sign up for. Um, and then my other comment is, I, and I brought this up once before, um, but like in terms of financing, when you go to do multiple structures on a lot, the bank is not going to like that. So you're going to end up having to condoize that in order to get it financed. So like that process, you're going to have to go through it anyway. So by us having the DRB not involved, the, the people are still going to have to go through that process. So why not? I don't know. I kind of agreed with Kathleen's um, letter um, that you're heading off problems before they start. Um, I know we're trying to make it easier for people to build, but it's not really going to be that much easier on them unless somebody comes in and doesn't need financing. And I don't think that that's necessarily what we're trying to encourage. Um, but I think that the whole point is, you know, people in town trying to develop their own properties. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to point that out. <clears throat> so you would put it back into the uh, PUD pot? I, I kind of, yeah, I think so in a way. Okay. I mean, but the whole privacy thing, I agree with David, that's really hard for them to decipher. I think it's not realistic to expect that to happen in the village and that people didn't, you know, they, they aren't expecting that where they live. I mean, Maybe they are because they, you know, are they only have one house really close. And when that second house comes even closer, it's going to, you know, feel very um, just <laughs> tough at first. But the reality is they have another house on the other side that's right next to them. So that's my thought. Thoughts. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go to Chris and then David, and then we'll have just about another like five minutes on this before we um put it table it to the next meeting so chris um no it's been a very interesting discussion and i really appreciate people's views i guess from a, a broader perspective if our intent is to really make it uh easier for uh infill development i'm concerned that 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 privacy provision basically provides uh, a way to not make it easier, <laughs> you know, and that uh, I think Adam made good points about that in Aaron too, you know, it's, there's, it's not that people won't be um, uh, uh, concerned about change that's happening close to their property. Of course they will, but what you want is for people to, to work that out in the process and then, and there not just be a regulatory step that becomes uh, you know, uh, a wrench that you can stick in the works overall. 
Um, so that's one thing. And then, you know, in, in reference to what Joy said about mm -hmm. um, financing, that's um, a good point, but it's also a characteristic of the current market. I think what we don't want is that that for the town regulations to assume that condoization is is always going to be uh, required or for every builder, you know. So, um, the, why why should we do the bank's job for them in that case? I guess. So uh, um, I would. Uh, I guess I'm 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 opting for the uh, you know less complicated option. So what do you see as the less complicated option? Putting it back into the PUD process, and the other question is about the village neighborhoods. Would you allow it there as a PUD, for instance? I haven't thought that one through all the way up. Okay. Well, we'll we'll take your comment on that on our next round. I think okay. David had a comment that he's now going to find his mute button, unmute button again. Oh, no. There we go. Oh, good. I'm used to my computer, not my phone. <laughs> right. Um, no, I, I, I think I've said everything I was going to say. It's just, um, mm -hmm. if you want to put in, uh, as, as was said by Adam, subjective issues give us standards to judge them by mm -hmm. so it's not just do i like red do i like blue do i like where these windows are the shape of the windows blah 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 but you know we just need guidance because otherwise um no matter what decision we make can be challenged mm -hmm. and the less ability uh people have to challenge based on procedural issues I think is safer for the town. Yeah, well, it's sort of a balancing act between flexibility and exact, you know, as you mentioned earlier, there's always gonna be a situation that doesn't exactly fit. So anyway, that's the balancing act that we go through, obviously. Um, okay, so I think that's good for an introduction to this topic, unless anyone has a, final comment that they want to make for right now. We're obviously not going to completely decide it. On our list of things to do is to look at Keith and Tyler's list of how they might change this um, as we move to our next agenda item and talk about the neighborhoods. We can talk about whether or not we want to have this included. Um, and then we can think about whether it should just apply to multi-unit buildings. Um, for the next go round on this topic. Anybody have anything else they want to say? Okay, great. Well, that's a good introduction, I think, to the fact that we need to resolve those issues um, from a couple of different directions. And we'll move on now to number six. Um, which is reviewing the neighborhoods. And we can include in that discussion, if we think, you know, if we think we're heading towards putting the two principal structures back into the PUD process, then the question becomes, do we want to have PUDs? Do we want to allow residential PUDs only in the village neighborhoods? Those are going to be the issues that come up there. Um, so, okay. So let's look, hopefully everybody has the current draft. Oh, and Kathleen under this topic did ask us to report on the letter that she sent, which I think all the commissioners got which basically is just suggesting that uh, their main concern now in the neighborhoods, since they understand that the density requirements is an Act 47 thing, and the minimum lot size is an Act 47 thing, their main concern was the two structures, the two residential structures on a single lot. And she expressed that 
she would like to see that go back to the DRB for review in the PUD process. So that was her letter that she sent us, and you all have that in the packet. So let's look at um, let's look at the village residential neighborhood south. Do you have that that you could share with us, Keith? I do. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what we'd like to do is to try to get as much of the language in this district, kind of um, the commission being okay as if they would vote for it, if it came up, vote to approve it, if it came up, and then leave these few things that we haven't fully resolved to add in later, like the two residential structures on a lot. So um, looking at draft, we're on draft 15 of these districts. The purpose and the features. Let's look at the purpose of the features. The only thing that has been changed about that is the addition of the three to four unit multifamily dwellings as part of the features. We're adding that in because by Act 47, we have to add that in as a permitted use. And we did, since the last time we looked at this, we added in something I think Gary brought up, the ability of the Round Church to continue to host weddings, concerts, and other events with on-site parking uh, on the adjacent lawn. So, and this is maybe not strictly necessary remembering that the features and the purpose are non-regulatory parts of this zoning they just suggest what the character of the neighborhood is um, so this is just to ensure that um, that ability of the round church remains viable we also added that all lots will be served by municipal water and sewer that's a feature of this district which is you know we knew that anyway so is everybody okay with the purpose and the features does anyone have any concerns about those or can we sort of check that off our list of things that we're okay with about this district okay so i'm not hearing anything at the moment that um anyone has a concern about that Moving on to the permitted uses section. So what we have in the permitted use section, we have the dwelling units and the group home and the home occupation, which are required to be allowed by earlier legislation in a residential district. But we have added dwelling three to four unit multifamily. This is from Act 47. So does anyone have a concern about the list of permitted uses? These are, you know, the neighbors, when we talked to them probably a year ago, whenever it was, didn't really want there to be any permitted commercial uses in this district. So we didn't put any in, they're all residential uses. Home occupation. So if anyone wants to have whatever, an antique store or whatever, it's going to have to be a home occupation. If you want there to be able to be those kind of freestanding uses, a museum, an antique store, whatever, then, you know, we can put them in commercial, I mean, in the conditional use list, or they would have to be a home occupation. So anyone have any comments about the permitted uses? Is this what people want to have here? All right, I'm not hearing anybody who wants something different there. Let's go on to the conditional uses. And just for David's benefit, he seems to be still here. This is a district that has been carved out of the AR district and it involves all the neighborhoods surrounding the round church south of the river thompson road part of cochran part of the huntington road and lower bridge street that's what these districts are we're coming out of the ar district 
and try to tie them more closely to the village. All right, conditional uses. So childcare facility, large home-based, is still a home-based facility, but it's bigger than the number of children that um, are in the one that the state requires you to have in your residential districts. People can think about that. I didn't really see any reason not to have it in there if it was big, because there is this hole between a center-based daycare and a family daycare, which has up to six children or some after-school children or whatever, there's standards about it. This has slightly more than that, but it's still a home-based uh, childcare operation. So you all can think about that. Going, scrolling further down this list, uh, park or open space. So these are two new ones that have been put in there. One is the supported housing facility. So there is part of Act 47 that requires that you allow um emergency shelters which have to do with homelessness or houselessness putting people up that is required now our supported housing facility has a lot of other things in it as well it has also nursing homes um i forget exactly but any kind of supported housing like uh, assisted living, those kinds of things. So the question there is whether we just want to put in exactly the wordage from Act 47, which is emergency shelters, the way they define it. And it's not defined like in a hurricane, all these people are gonna be there or in a flood. It's defined as people who are without homes. So let's think about that one. And if you would review the definition of a supported housing facility and see the things that are listed in there, do we want to allow all of those things or do we just want to allow the one that Act 47 mandates? So that's the question there, the supported housing facility. Then the last one is the two residential structures on a lot. Well, this is what we've just been talking about. And uh, I don't hear a lot of support for it being either a permitted use or a conditional use. Most people, if they want to think about it, seem to want to think about it in the PUD process. So the question is, do we want to allow for a residential PUD in this neighborhood or not at all? So. Those two in blue need to be thought about. Any questions about that or thoughts about that? At the moment, obviously, we'll be coming back when everybody's thought about these things. All right, so getting down to 3.12.4, this is a new section, residential density, because we have learned that residential density is not a dimensional standard, which in the RC district, we had it listed under the dimensional standards, which is not correct. It is not a dimensional standard. So it's a freestanding section because Act 47 requires that we have a minimum required allowed density of five units per acre which is one dwelling unit for every 8,712 square feet. Round number. So um, under Revy's guidance, we were rounding these numbers off, but there doesn't seem to be much appetite at the moment for that. So we're not rounding it off. We're just saying it's a fifth of an acre because that's what the statute says which is 8,712 square feet. And that is an Act 47 thing. So 
Related to that, however, is a dimensional requirement under 3.12.5, which is that the lot size has the minimum lot size in order to achieve a density of five units per acre has to be a fifth of an acre. So, of course, this is quite different from the original um, discussion that we had with the neighbors who, because this district was being carved out of the AR district where the de facto density is one acre per dwelling unit, they had originally wished to go to a half acre as the minimum lot size, a half acre being 22,000 square feet. But if you're required in residential districts served by water and sewer, Act 47, if you're required to have five units per acre, that means the minimum lot size has to be a fifth of an acre. So we have changed that to also 8,712 feet as the minimum lot size that you could have. That doesn't mean everybody's going to run out and subdivide their half acres into fifth of an acres, but this is seems to be required by Act 47. Gary. Um, I really like what you did here. I think this is the really straightforward and honest way to deal with that state requirement is to just lay it out in those square footage. And I just say that in A, I think comparing this with the residential north, I think it, it ends with lot dimension. I think that goes with the next line. See, at uh, the end, the end so of, yeah, if you, if you look at in the same section in the north residential, yeah, you know, B starts with lot dimension. Oh, it's a typo. It's just kind of, it's just kind of hanging out there in A. Where... Okay, so the lot size is not anywhere to be seen. Let me look at my copy here. No, no. So 312.5 dimensional requirements A, minimum lot size, 8712 square feet, parentheses, okay. one fifth right. A, and yeah. then lot dimension goes into B. Yeah, so B under B under the VRNN, we just cross out the words lot dimension. Because number B is the same as B here, which is the one with the radius of 25 feet. Okay, so you're saying just get rid of the the words lot dimension yeah get rid of the words lot dimensions yeah. they were incorrectly added into that it's the same as okay. b here that we're looking at okay then we'll have to do that when we get to the north section too, yeah then. we'll do that when we get to the north we'll just cross okay. out those words right so okay anybody else so the rest of the dimensional requirements um the circle with the radius is 25 feet is just to make sure there's a little big enough piece of land that seems to be in all, you know, all the rest of our zoning. I don't know if anybody has a problem with that. The lot frontage. And this is the lot frontage that we had with our original discussion of the neighborhood south neighbors whether you can require a lot frontage of 75 feet in a fifth of an acre lot i don't know keith what do you think about that that number seems kind of high to me for a fifth of an acre lot it seems like we ought to be making that number smaller now um. I have no issue with that. I mean, you're talking about 8,712 square foot lots, potentially. Yeah. Uh, that's your minimum. Um, yeah, 75 feet, a, 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 it's probably a heavy lift, to be honest with you, if you're going to subdivide. So I, I would reduce that. Okay. But, Anybody have any thoughts about what you would reduce it to? Gary, what do you think? 50. It's, you have it 60 in the north residential now, but I, I think, I know when I was walking around that 
really nice old residential neighborhood in uh, in Boise where everybody seems to want to live there. I was measuring off, you know, just pacing off, and a lot of those lots were 50-foot lots, and they had charming old homes on them. Mm -hmm. They so, didn't seem like they were crowding their neighbors too tight to me. Yeah, I would say if 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 you're looking at the side setbacks in a district, which are 10 feet, and if you have a 50-foot wide minimum, that you're only going to be able to, to produce a 30-foot wide house. Does that work for you as a, as a builder? Gary, I'd also ask you, Adam, on that also. I think that's reasonable. I mean, uh, 30 feet wide doesn't, you know, if the gable is facing a house, a 30 foot wide by 30 by 40 house is pretty hefty size house for a one fifth acre lot. Um, okay. I, I guess I just did the math quick. So 50, 50 foot gives us 100 and about 175 foot deep lot, perfect rectangle. And uh, 75 gives us like 112, somewhere around there. I think somewhere between 50 and 75, anywhere between there. 75 seems high. 50 seems like the bottom end, but you know, 50 to 60 in there seems reasonable to me. I don't know what Gary thinks about 60. How about 60? That's in between. And that's what we have in the North. I don't know what you all think about that. <clears throat> I can live with either one of those 50 or 60. I think 75 is high. Okay. I agree with Gary. I think, I would I would kind of lean more towards the 50, I think. I think 30 feet of buildable space is uh, pretty reasonable. Okay. Anybody else have anything they want to say about that? <clears throat> All right. So we'll have a final resolution on that when we meet on this again 50 60 55 57 and a half i don't know <laughs> okay um the maximum lot coverage we had as 40 percent up from 30 percent in the ar district we had 40 percent, but that also seemed small if you're going to have a fifth of an acre lot yeah. so even 50 percent seems like maybe but you know as gary said about the neighborhoods everybody everywhere i mean you read the planning literature people want to live in these old neighborhoods with small houses with houses that are close together they're charming you know they have and you can't build them anymore the way things are so um it's a paradox anyway so 50% lot coverage. I don't know. What do you folks think about that? Better than 40. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, the purpose of a lot coverage obviously is for um, permeable surfaces as opposed to impermeable surfaces. So, I mean, that, that, that's what you got to wrap your head around with this. Um, you have you have lots, and I'm just spitballing here, folks. Um, you have lots that are served by by water and sewer. Um, so uh, I don't know how you want to go about that whole permeability and impermeable impermeability issue. That, that's really what this is based on. Yeah, and as we know, you know, I mean, one thing that we ought to be thinking about is not only flooding from our rivers, but flooding from intense rain. And every time you take away it, permeable surfaces, you reduce the ability of the ground to absorb any water. It's not going to, you know, obviously there's a certain amount of water per minute that will overcome the saturation capacity of the ground. But for every part of impermeable surfaces you have, that's that much less water that's going to be absorbed. So maybe from a planning for the future standpoint, we ought to be thinking about trying to leave permeable surfaces. I don't know. You know, I mean, our sewer, uh, our stormwater capacity is a whole issue that is going to have to be dealt with in Richmond at some point. Um, Joy? 
So I, when I look at these things, I'm constantly comparing them to what exists there. Um, and when I think about, <clears throat> so the lot size and the lot coverage and how many units. Um, so to put this in perspective for me, our duplex on Baker Street is 0.29 of an acre. And we have two units there. And I would guess that the lot coverage, boy, with the garage, <clears throat> maybe 60, you know, like, so like those are the things that exist. I know, it, uh, and I'm just feeling like, I don't see how we're like helping the situation. Um, so you'd be that, inclined to go to 60. Yeah, I mean, and I, yeah. I I know this is a big step for everybody that we went this far, but it's right. I mean, I would, I'm having a hard time with people one getting upset about sort of what we're doing, and I think we're just a yeah. Anyway, so I yeah. just wanted. I know Adam knows our house. I know some people like it helps me to put it in perspective to like really like see what that is. Um, <clears throat> so, and, and honestly, I'm going to go down and measure how far it is from the road. Right. And actually yeah. I was thinking about sitting down with Keith and really looking or my, or our civil engineer and getting the numbers and showing it to you guys and saying like, okay, so these are like, let's go down this, these different streets. Like, let's look at every one of them and what exists, but. Yeah. Well, that would be <clears throat> super helpful. I think, you know, is so that we could have an image of what it's like. The other thing is, if we're going to try to allow, and we are allowing ADUs and duplexes on these right. tiny lots, then you're going to have to have more impervious area for the ADU, certainly, and then and the parking for the ADU. And so in order above, to get, go ahead. Up above where it says maximum residential den density, one dwelling unit for every 87, 12 square feet of land. So are we duplexes count as two du dwelling units, right? The duplex counts as two, but the ADU doesn't count as one by itself. You wouldn't even be able to do a duplex yeah. on an existing lot right now. You wouldn't be able to do what we have existing. Right, the duplex would require 17, double that, right? Whatever two times 18, seven, 12 is. That would be the duplex, but you could have an ADU and a single family home on a lot because that ADUs. only counts as one yeah. dwelling with, unit. Yeah, you're dealing with a thousand square feet on an ADU and, and that's, you know, that's a whole nother discussion. Do we want to increase the size of our ADUs? You know, and, and an ADU, again, you're going to have the same problem with the bank giving you the, the, well, I don't know, what is that building worth? And the other, and then da, 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 and is it going to be a condo? And um, so a duplex is much easier to build and it's easier for the, <clears throat> to finance. But anyway, and, and it's less expensive to build, right? You have one shared wall. <clears throat> I mean, can you build an ADU? Yeah, I guess you could. Yep. Yeah, you, you can have an ADU in the house or attached to the house yeah, or yeah all right yeah. but then just has those to, other... you can't you can't move right you wouldn't be able to rent that out right you'd have to live there yeah um, with the adus i mean there are all these <laughs> questions about the owner living one in one or the other and also who's going to check that you know, so I would, if you want to move I guess to Florida I'm, and you want to rent it to somebody else, who's going to go and check that? Nobody's going to go and be checking that. So, you know, we, we might want to change those parameters about ADUs. I'm pushing back on the, well, you could do it with an ADU because an ADU is not a stand, a, a, like a, a, a unit of housing that's treated the same as a, another apartment or something that somebody can you know, rent out at any time. I and mean, if we really want to increase housing, ADUs aren't like a huge, they're, they're helpful, but they're only limited in yep. how they can. Yep. They serve a purpose. <laughs> they, they certainly serve a purpose. And, uh, but to increase housing, I would agree. That's, that's definitely not a panacea. That's for sure. Yep. Well, I mean, this is part of the reason that we wanted to do something with the 
two structures on a lot is to get away from the ADU, but you're saying the bank doesn't, you know, that's a problem from your financing. With the ADUs, the state is trying to help finance ADUs, maybe oh. because they understand that you can't really get money for them, but, you know, there are these programs that Virginia, I wasn't saying not to do two structures on a lot. I was just saying yeah. that you, they're going to have to go through the process of turning it into a PUD kind of anyway. Yeah. So why not just handle it that way? Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So you would be okay, Joy, with having as a conditional use a residential PUD in these two neighborhoods? Yes. And I will do the work. I don't know if it'll be for the next meeting, but in, in the next month, I will try and sit down and look at different rep neighborhoods and what their lot coverage is and um, That'd be how great. large the lots are. That would be super helpful. Um, I Gary. On my list. <laughs> okay. Right. In your spare time. Yep. Um, Gary. So, uh, just to go back to maximum lot coverage. I think one thing, if we hold it, say, to 50%, it, one of the things that may come out of that is that people will end up having as short a driveway as possible so that um, they can meet that requirement. Whereas from a design standard, it might be nicer to get the cars away from the street a little more and have the parking a little bit set back. So. But we may be discouraging that by keeping it to 50% or whatever number you pick. Mm -hmm. If while we're on that subject, Keith and I spent a long time talking about this this morning was the point of view of not having garage doors and parking in front of garages right in the front of the house but having them set back and it came up in the multi-unit family standards which says that you have to have eight feet you have to be eight foot back which is quite a common standard you have to be eight feet behind the front of the building with your garage door or your you know parking in front of your garage well, how do you feel about that i mean there seem to be pros and cons of there are a lot of houses that have a garage door that a garage that is flush with the front of the building we have those but the other side of that question is you don't want your street facing facade to be all garage doors you know you want it to be pedestrian friendly with doors and have the cars set back it does mean you have a longer driveway you have to drive further you have to plow more whatever I don't know. Do you have a feeling about that? Yeah. Well, I, th I think the worst thing, and you see it, I think there's a development in Jericho that has a whole row of houses where the door is set back a number of feet from the garage. So when you look down the street from an angle, all you see is a row of garage doors. And right. So you, you know, that's, that's the absolute worst situation. But um, yeah. I don't know, requiring maybe eight feet too much, but requiring a, a minimum setback, I think it's a good idea. Hmm. Adam or Joy, do you have any feeling about that? About the this garage door setback question? It relates to the other standards we talked about. I guess I don't have any uh, super strong opinion on it. I agree with Terry that keeping them set back uh, some either small incremental amount or even flush or more would be, uh, well, would go pretty far. I know exactly what, I guess I know exactly which house is Gary's talking about. And it, it is, uh, wouldn't strike me as alarming to sing it on paper, but when you drive by it, it's pretty obvious that having mm -hmm. the garage stick out is a little awkward. Um, I don't know what that number is. Maybe even flush should be fine. I, I guess I'm not, as long as the garage isn't in front. I mean, uh, if that's someone's design choice, it's not my thing, but uh, I don't see it as inherently bad for the neighborhood. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, these nice, charming, popular neighborhoods are 
pedestrian friendly. You know, they look friendly. They have doors and windows facing the street and little front yards. So, you know, it's that balancing between, well, people can do whatever they want with their property. But on the other hand, if you want to make a lasting neighborhood that people want to live in, you want to make yeah. it human scale and appealing somehow. And, you know, so it's a balance anyway. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, I think, I think doing something to push a garage either behind or at least uh, kind of set back from the house does do a huge amount to, like you said, make it feel like you're walking by houses and not carports where you might get run over at any given point. Um, I don't know if it's all psychological, but I'm guilty of that then. Um, so I think it's, <laughs> it's worth doing something there. Uh, you know, walking down West Main Street, I was walking down today because my we did some stuff and my truck battery died. And uh, every house you walk by, there's a main door and a porch on the front for the most part on the north side of West, West Main Street. And uh, it's like, it feels like a place that you can comfortably walk and you're encouraged to walk and you should be walking. Yep. And there are porches and not that everybody yeah. uses any of those front doors. You know, people all use their <laughs> back door near the car where it's hard and back. I had an interesting conversation with but. someone actually, <clears throat> um, I believe he's from Essex, but, uh, and they were just complaining about how, so get the long story. The, uh, the conclusion was that port front porches should be exempt from the setback requirement within a certain amount of feet to encourage people to put their house where they want and then add the front porch because it makes the whole, it makes the front of the house look used, even if it is not, like you said, um, and yeah. versus having just a door or no door and a door on the side, it really feels like you're walking by a house where you shouldn't be walking by. They expect privacy and you happen to be walking by versus a porch seems like you should be walking by and talking to someone who's on the porch. So, Sitting in a rocking chair on the porch. Yeah, exactly. Or, and we'll all do that in our spare time after Joy's done her uh, all her <laughs> surveying. So, yeah, I, 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 would add, I, I would add that that those standards for the garages are for multifamily dwellings; they're not for single-family dwellings. So, I mean, you you got to keep that in mind also. And I think the intent of that, <laughs> which I agree with, is not to have a bank of three garage doors. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, I get that, you know, um, but if you have a single family dwelling, you got to have you got you got to have some some leeway as to where to put your garage. I mean, I agree. It shouldn't be in the, obviously in, in in front of the, the imaginary front line setback of, of where your structure is. Um, but I don't think it's horrible in that regard either. But that's just me for single family dwellings. But, but I mean, that whole standard is for multifamily dwelling. So. Right. So in this. Uh the one we're looking at right now, the village residential neighborhood south, the front yard setback, if we move on from the lot coverage, has attached garage with a minimum of five feet further back than the front of the, that's five feet further back than the front of the principal structure. I don't know if we want that in there or we want it even with and back, you know, even with or behind the front of the structure. The same with the accessory structure or dwelling so that you can't put a garden shed in your front yard. It's saying that you need to have 10 feet behind the front of the principal structure to give it that pedestrian friendly, human scale, whatever. Yeah, I would say those are pretty typical um, points in, in zoning in, in more urban areas. You know, uh, you know, the Levitt towns of, of the world. I mean, even uh, I know that, um, I mean, we just had a comment from from um, uh, Aaron on, on Virginia and what they do in Virginia. And that's where I cut my teeth. And I know exactly what she's talking about. These, these houses share the same footers. That's how close they are. So uh, it, it's pretty wild when we would, as a surveyor back in the day, we would we would look and look at these shared footers and the banks would have to, they wouldn't release any more money until you had that first initial pour and that they were on shared footers, but that's neither here nor there, so. It's like Dorset Street in South Burlington is like that, mm -hmm. huge houses, no land. And of course, all of us people who come from Richmond, where we love to have the land, a little bit of land, think it's wild and crazy that these houses are huge and right next to each other. Um, all right, so can we go 
back further on in this document where we were before, Keith, which, so anyway, so if people could think about these numbers and if Joy wants to do some measurements, that would be fabulous so that we can actually envision what these things look like. Um, as Keith said, these are sort of standard numbers with the setbacks, the rear yard, the front yard. Uh, I don't know if we want to think we need to reduce them for a fifth of an acre or if they still work for a fifth of an acre. It just means you have smaller houses, which is kind of okay, it seems like. If you're going to have small lots to have small houses on them, makes them more affordable. I would, I would point out that the only uh, the only catch to the 30 feet is if you, have a, if you do have a 50 foot um, front, you know, frontage and a 50 foot wide lot all the way back, with 10 feet on either side, uh, I think the minimum driveway standard in Richmond is 12 feet. So you can't even technically build a 30 foot yeah. wide <laughs> on that. You, you can put the driveway right on the property line, which you're allowed to do because it's not a structure, but you would be limited to 28 feet for the house then because you can only be 12 feet from one side and 10 from the other or whatever. So yeah. Um, yeah, so there are. So maybe 60 feet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I, I mean, I guess I'm not inherently, I'm not saying that we should increase the front, the front frontage to accommodate that. I think it's up to people's design requirements, but I don't think we should. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think decreasing the setbacks would be unpopular. It wouldn't be the worst thing ever, in my opinion, but it would be unpopular. But um, yes, we would be bumping. 60 feet does uh, put you into, or sorry, 50 feet puts you into a lots of constraints, just not frontage, that are beyond frontage that are kind of limited. Yep. What you can do. OK, all right, well, <laughs> we'll come back to your exact recommendations, maybe at our next time around with this. I think 50 feet's good. Yes. OK. Um, can we go a little further down in this document, unless anybody else wants to talk about these setbacks? OK, then hearing no, no comments about that. Let's see, we've got another um, 15 minutes, I guess, with these documents. Uh, going down to 3.12.6, district specific development standards. Okay, we can see what we've got here. Now in the RC districts, we had quite a lot more district specific development standards because we had very particular issues that we were addressing. In the gateway, we had the scenic entrance to Richmond appearance. So there were quite a lot of design requirements. In the village RC district, we had being able to blend commercial and residential in a way that was good for both of those. So there were more standards. In this case, we're not needing to have quite so many development standards specific to these residential districts. But so what we've got so far here, we haven't talked about these previously. All lots are served by municipal water and sewer. OK, we know that. That's fine. Then the sidewalks question. Um, so there are various opinions about requiring sidewalks or requiring applicants to put in sidewalks, requiring the town to put in sidewalks. What, you know, what are the requirements? Um, so what we've got here as a conversation starter is for all lots that abut existing sidewalks, the applicant shall provide a continuation of that sidewalk. This is on the frontage, except for one single family home or one duplex on a lot. Those people don't have to bother. But if it's like a multifamily building, then you have to add to the sidewalk. Um, if no sidewalk is abutted at the date of application, the applicant shall provide a sidewalk easement to the town. So I don't know what you all think about this. This was kind of a compromise with 
just flat out requiring sidewalks and just not having any requirements about sidewalks. If we had gotten around to making an official map, putting in where we wanted sidewalks, then that would take care of it. We haven't done that. That's going to be a long process. We're dealing with lots of sidewalk scopings in our transportation committee that is now putting in sidewalks. In our village areas, do we want to say something about sidewalks? So people can think about that anyway for next time that we can have a discussion about it. The other development standards are under site design. And this is another case where Dave, David will hate this because it says parking shall be located at the side or the rear of the building, if possible. Well, <laughs> your if possible may not be my if possible. So it's kind of subjective. Do we want to recommend it or do we want to not say anything about parking? I mean, we also don't want lots of parking in the front yards of these houses if you want to have the pedestrian friendly villagey look. Um, and then it talks a little bit about the um, not having dumpsters in the front yard. That the second point under site, site design standards, having things concealed. So those are the only things we have so far. I don't know if people want others or don't want these or at the moment have anything that they want to say about them. I have one comment on the yeah. uh, freestanding utilities or mechanicals. So you know, most people, it seems like are putting in heat pumps and that is, unless you mount it on the building, which most people don't, they they put it on a pedestal, is a freestanding mechanical. And, you know, you have to have those, in a lot of cases, fairly close to where you want to heat. So it seems like a tough one to try to completely block. I, I think they're kind of ugly, but it's might be the best heating system out there right now, uh, for some reasons. Uh, there's many splits. Yeah, yeah, but, but a lot. At least the ones I see go in are on little pe four leg pedestals that are a couple feet away from the building. Uh, you get it out of the drip line or something. Mm -hmm. And I think it might. Are those going to come under this? That they have to be completely blocked from view of any public road? I would say they probably would be interpreted as being in this category. So, you know, we could either eliminate the freestanding utilities or mechanicals item altogether, or we could put except cold weather air to heat pump equipment, if we wanted to try to be energy conscious, which we should be trying to be. Um, or you can just say that they don't have to be completely screened from view, which our uh, legal counsel is always telling us to be sure that we are clear as to whether you just need a bush in front of them or they need to be completely screened from view. So you have to be clear one or the other because people will do one or the other, which might not be adequate. So I think that is a good point to think about. But, uh, I would say we should remove the screening form entirely based mostly on the fact that driving around town now, any house that I can see that has had heat pumps either put in as a new construction or a retrofit, almost none of them are screened. Um, and it seems, I, I, I guess, it doesn't seem to be bothering anyone. I don't, it seems like we're looking for a solution for a problem that doesn't exist. They're pretty, as Gary said, they're not the greatest looking things, but they're also but very far from the least, for the most imposing. Um, so 
I mean, the only two things I can really think of that would require screening would be outdoor heat pump units and uh, electrical vaults or transformers. And uh, the electrical vaults have pretty specific requirements from the power company about where you can plant things around them. So that might be a non-starter as well. And how about the dumpsters and the waste containers? Uh, uh, <laughs> that's uh. so subjective. Uh, yeah. Um, we don't want dumpsters in the front yard. We come, no, um, come back to that. I think, it's I think better really not to put your dumpster in the front yard. I think locating them behind the, uh, I, I think having them located behind a building is more important than having them screened from view from the front of the building. So seeing them from the front of the building is not nearly imposing as imposing in my mind as having them in front of the building. So I think if they say shall be located at the front. Uh, personally, I would say that dumpsters and mechanicals and freestanding mechanicals and stuff should be separate. But then I would say that if we make them so they have to be located behind the front line of the building, that would solve, that would satisfy uh, the heat pump and electric, uh, heat pump issue. But for an electrical transformer, I mean, that doesn't really, you could, the power company can tell you where you have to put it and you don't have an option. So, I mean, it seems weird to me that the trans that would be a freestanding utility and it seems odd that the uh, town would tell you you can't put a transformer between the pole and the house you have to run the power by the house and then back to the house which costs everyone money makes it less serviceable uh, yeah, well so know. this is allowing you to put it in the front but it just has to be screened so Maybe you know allow one the same with allow the dumpster the other. what i i would yeah i guess um i would i would say that we break the dumpsters out and in and, and uh, require dumpsters behind the building would be my so you just flat point. out wouldn't allow them to be in the front screened or otherwise yeah yes and i think dumpsters in my mind well, when you say huh i don't know i guess i'm i guess i, I hadn't thought this through clearly because we say dumpsters or waste containers how does that work with you know daily pulling your containers out to the front so they can be grabbed i mean is that yeah that uh, uh, how, do we, how do we enforce that i don't see yeah, how we can do that realistically if someone goes on vacation and puts them out on friday to be picked up monday and they stay out all week are they then in violation of the code because they happen to have their trash picked up while they're on vacation and sat out for seven days? That doesn't well, seem reasonable. But. Yeah, except they wouldn't be flagged and prosecuted for that unless they were they lived out there, unless those containers lived out there all the time. And maybe we don't really want that. We don't want people yeah, no, leaving them out all the time. Certainly someone who just leaves them out for a week, it's not going to be a problem. I mean, there's many things in our zoning that people aren't you know, it's like the ADU brother-in-law that we don't prosecute people, even though it's, you know, you have to abide by the requirements. So anyway, so you could think about this for next time. Yeah, How should we do this? I'm going to that because I obviously don't have a clear opinion. <laughs> yeah. Do we want them to be required to be in back any kind of waste containers? Do we want them to be allowed to be in front but screened? Do we want to get rid of the mechanicals and the heat pumps? Chris, you have something on this. Uh, yeah, I just I think I, I'm feeling the same way Adam is about it. I, I think that uh, freestanding utilities or mechanicals should not be uh, subject to the screening requirement, particularly because we're talking about, um, in most cases, you know, heat pumps or compressor based systems. And it's and it's um, there there are just constraints, uh, you know, when you're installing one, particularly in retrofit applications of where you can put it. You know, so sometimes those do have to end up in in front of buildings, mm -hmm. and um, and the other thing too is that they require um, good airflow. So if screening is put in place that interferes with that, then you've got a problem too. So, I mean, I think Adam made a good point. Is there's plenty of them out there now that aren't screened. Nobody seems to be complaining about it that much. So I don't know that we should go looking for trouble. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the dumpsters? <laughs> Yeah, I'd like them to be behind buildings too. I just don't know. Is that always is that always uh, practical? Well, in fifty foot wide lots, that might not be. Okay. Well, we have to think about that and whether we need some partial constraint on it. Like you can't have a dumpster for more than thirty days or something in the front, or maybe you allow the dumpster in front, but it has to be screened. So. Anyway, people could think about that. We clearly don't have a complete picture, I think, on that just yet. 
Um, so, um, the final thing, we've got a couple, just a couple more minutes to finish this. And by the way, the neighborhoods north is pretty similar to this one, really. There's not that much difference. You can look at the two now that we've made the lot size the same in both districts and the density the same in both districts. There's really not that much difference between the two. And people, one thing you could think about is, do we just want to make them into one district called the village neighborhoods? Or do we want to keep them separate? I've had comments of people who want them to be separate, but looking at them parameter by parameter, there's not that much difference. Anyway, just a couple more things. We've got the additional multifamily housing standards, which right now um, says all lots that contain more than two dwelling units shall adhere to the multifamily housing development standards and we want to consider whether we want that word to be lots or we want that word to be buildings and we want the number to be three or contains more than two which equals three do we want it to be more than four um so those are the things that we want to think about there and then we're going to look at the newly revised potential standards themselves that Keith and Tyler are going to work on and bring back to us. So those are the things that we want to think about there. I still think it's important to give the neighbors of these new multi-unit buildings the feeling that these buildings are not going to affect their property values and they're going to be good neighbors and the people who you know that they're going to be nice places to live so with amenities and not with dumpsters in the front yard so you could think about that do we want that word to be buildings then the multiple structures on a lot that's the two residential properties it seems like people are leaning towards putting just putting it back in to the PUD process. I have a quick question, Virginia. Yeah. Really quick. We don't have to answer it now, but um, what would be the like, what would be the benefit if we're trying to make it easier, but also encourage the uh, legwork ahead of time for like conflict mitigation? What would be the benefit of doing a PUD versus a um, DRB requirements? I guess Keith would probably answer that. He could probably answer that more. But what, like, um, what would the PUD provide? If we had clear expectations for the DRB to review that based on that a DRB approval would not. So you mean well, so the Sorry, I, I can the PUD the much. PUD process involves conditional use review and subdivision review if there's going to be a subdivision. That's so what yeah, the PUD process is. Exactly. So, so what's the what's the benefit of putting it in the PUD process if we could put it in the in a conditional use process. The benefit of putting it in the PUD process would be that you can um, rearrange some of the parameters. Yeah. So you Gives can more, leave more, more, more open percent. space okay. and put all four units in one single building in one part of the lot and, you know, so. The, the key phrase is flexibility of design. Okay, so it's more oversight, more legwork, but more flexibility. Yes, exactly. And Thank you. one of the things that we're doing since we're revising the PUD process with the amendments that we already approved is to actually make it clear what a PUD is, you know, and why you would do it. It's answering your exact question. Yeah. Why would you do a Perfect. PUD? It may or may not involve a subdivision, but the point of a PUD is that you can rearrange some of the parameters, the dimensional standards, to meet the circumstances. But and I would really density. like... Go ahead, Keith. I said, but not the density. You still have to follow the but density. not the density. You still have to follow the density, but <clears throat> you can change some of the parameters based on the DRB's feeling. <laughs> Uh, about what the best use of the space is. So we're hoping to make that more, more clear than it is right now. Like Tyler 
tells me a PUD has to be a subdivision. Well, the districts that we've been working with in the IC, it says you can have a PUD as long as it's not a subdivision. So clearly you can have a PUD that's not a subdivision. So anyway, we need to just lay out what is a subdivision, what is a PUD, you know, what makes a piece of property that's divided into six lots a subdivision versus a PUD. So anyway, keep we'll keep you posted on that, Gary. Yeah. So can I go back up a couple of lines where the residential parking section? Yes. So the last, this last sentence, more spaces may be provided if need is anticipated. Is that, I thought the law, Oh, I, see. I haven't read the law, but. Wait, I, where are you reading here? Right uh, oh, okay. All right. Oh, yes. Go up to page three. Yep, got, got it. Yep. So I thought the law reduced the requirement of parking to one space. That's a floor. They reduce oh, okay. the so required parking. Yep. So all that you can put in your zoning regulation is the that one space is required, but there's no maximum number of spaces that you could put in. There's a maximum okay. number you can require. Okay. So my question is, is that sentence allowing the DRB to go above the one, or is that just allowing the developer to go above the one? Who's anticipating? It's it's to allow the developer to 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 increase, but I mean okay. the bottom because before it was two, I believe, and that was a restraint, so they reduced it to one by statute. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, can the DRB the DRB can't require that you have more Correct. than one? But the DRB could allow you to have more than one. But they wouldn't be involved in a single family dwelling anyway. So right. you know, it's really, it's moot. You know, it's when you get to the multifamilies, that's what we're talking about. And there has to be a minimum of three because that's when a multifamily starts. Right. Three units. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's all that we have time for right now for these. I think we've made some progress, flagged some issues that we want to talk about next yeah. time that we revisit this. Um, and we'll also look at the north, the north neighborhood. But like I said, they're pretty, pretty similar. Okay. Any final comments on this? Gary, is your hand still up or is it oh, not no. down? Okay. Sorry. All right. So I want to spend just a few minutes on the budget, the planning and zoning budget, which Keith and I have been talking about. We have a line item and we have money in it. And we want to know if we have stuff we want to do with that money, if we want that money in there, if we want more money. So Keith, go ahead. Yeah, so there's a line item um, in my in, in the budget for my department, and it's called contract services for planning and zoning. And um, what I would try to what I would like the, the commission to do would be to come up with some ideas to justify an increase to five thousand dollars, which is currently in the budget right now. If, if you have some ideas about how we can utilize this five thousand dollars. Uh, th that would be greatly appreciated. Um, we still have $5,000 in the budget until June, until the end of June of, of 2024. So we're anticipating hopefully on kicking something down the road um, here soon uh, with some type of project with a consultant, but that may be difficult because of time restraints. Um, so at this point, I'd like to solicit some ideas as to what the commission would like to do. Um, and some of those ideas that we were bandying about um, was uh, uh, ideas on Jonesville, on to have public outreach to discuss with the Jonesville residents on what you know they would like in that area through a consultant. Um, that that's one. Uh, we we can also develop some graphics if need be through a consultant. 
Yeah, I, I just want to plant the seed that we do have money to to help us with our endeavors and communications. And Virginia, I don't know if you have anything specific you'd like to add to that. No, I mean, I think it is good. We never were asked this question really before. Revy just used the money for consultants or interns or, you know, things that he thought were important that worked out actually really pretty well. So it would be good to think about it. The Jonesville thing is, you know, we don't really have time to go and do focus groups and talk to people down there. What what are we going to do with Jonesville? Nobody has ever been able to figure out what to do with Jonesville and how to incorporate it into anything. Um, when we get to the AR district, we're definitely going to have to talk about, you know, the farm and forest land on farm businesses. How can we help on farm businesses? You know, can we buy some consulting services to help us with on farm businesses? Do we need any mapping work, big picture maps or um that we could any other kind of graphics that people could do so and the timeline for this is that really by our next meeting which is on whatever it is the 15th of november keith has to have your ideas because he has to submit the budget proposal for the next fiscal year in december so, um, so it's now ish that we need to think about this and come up with what do we want to do with this money? It's in the budget. Do we not want to spend this money? Do we want to save the taxpayers this money or do we want to do something kind of useful with it? And, you know, right now, Keith is pretty flat out in terms of the housing committee, the transportation committee, the planning commission, other responsibilities so if there's some way that we can you know offload some kind of research project or outreach project that would be great yeah so i i think basically the the exercise is for you guys to give it a think and come back with some ideas um we're gonna we're gonna keep the five thousand i'm pretty sure i can justify that but it could, but if we increase it to 10 i need to have justification for that additional five thousand dollars um, I, I believe we do have the bandwidth or we do have it in our budget in order to do that. Uh, but I don't want to be frivolous with it. I, I, obviously, I need to justify it. Yeah. And even the five thousand dollars, I mean, we should probably justify what we're using that money for. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And it's not legal review because that's in some other budget. Yes, it is. So yeah, it's, and it's not for interns either. I have a line item of two thousand dollars for interns. So, OK. Yep. All right. So that's the homework along with the other homework that we generated this evening. Um, a brief moment of plans for the future. We're not going to get to eight other business. Jolena Court has been, we've been talking to them a little bit and have said they need to come in and talk to us if they're interested in changing the density the commercial requirement or the parking at Jolina Court. Apparently they're building number two, which has been approved, but they're not going to make because the market's not right for it. So, but we have told them they need to come to us and tell us what, you know, what yeah. they need. So when they do that, then we will put them on the agenda and we will have a full discussion about it. There is an opportunity there to add more housing to Richmond, which we need obviously, but we need to know what they want for it so far. What they've wanted for it hasn't been suitable. So anyway, um, so at our next meeting, the 1115 meeting, we need the ideas on the budget. And we are going to continue to try to resolve these issues about the neighborhoods. Um, hopefully have more information about, you know, the lot coverage and all that kind of stuff, if we can get it. And we will also discuss whether or not we want to have a meeting on the 20th of December. That'll be next week uh, or, you know, next time. The following meeting is our 12-6 meeting, December 6th. That's the public hearing. And the whole meeting is going to be the public hearing on that package of amendments, the bylaw report, 
the information we gain from our town attorney review, the additional changes that we're going to have to make if in fact we're going to remove the master development plan language. We have to remove it from the subdivision regs. There's a few other places that it has to be. So the outreach from the people who come or contact us, the additional changes we'll need to make, the attorney review, all that will come out at the public hearing and then we can either continue the public hearing if we need to or we can end the public hearing and just take all that information and consider it for our December 20th meeting if we have it which we think we could if every you know we just need to know that enough people are going to come I, I would also add to anticipate that the that the uh, December 6th meeting uh, will be a hybrid uh, I mean, obviously, uh, members can show up, but we'll be having it at the town hall, town municipal center, as well as uh, remotely. So, yeah. Any questions about that? Final comments? I move we adjourn. You're on. Great. Mm -hmm. All right. I have like one minute or maybe two minutes before nine. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Seconded by Mark. All right. Is there anybody who is opposed to adjourning at this time? <laughs> Hearing no takers for that, we stand adjourned and we'll see you all on the 15th of November. Okay. Great. Night, Thanks for all the legwork, Virginia. Thanks. Yes. You're welcome. <laughs> yep. Have a good night. Yeah, you as well. Yeah, enjoy the snow. What? Ah. Yeah. <laughs>